Welcome to the Celon Pharma Capital Markets Day. My name is Małgosia Siewierska and I'm head of investor relations in the company. Today, we are going to give you a helicopter view on our company's operation. Let me introduce you our today's agenda. Our meeting is divided into three main parts. First would be corporate session with business and uh, innovation operations and financial highlights. Then we will move to the Kyola session to discuss the most important unmet medical needs into three therapeutic areas, neuropsychiatry, oncology, and inflammatory disease. At the end, we invite you to participate in Q&A session, but feel free to share with us your comments and thoughts during all the meeting. In any moment, please use the chat below the stream, which is available at uh, our website. Now it's the time to introduce you our today's speakers. From the company side, uh, executive member, uh, board members, Maciej Wieczorek, CEO, Jacek Glinka, CCO, and Iwona Giedronowicz, the CFO. Call session will be hosted by Piotr Wierzbiński, the psychiatrist, and his guest in this section will be Professor Eduard Vieta from University of Barcelona, Professor Jair Suarez from University of Texas, and Professor Joanna horostowska venimko National Institute of Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases in Warsaw. And finally, uh, I would like to add that the presentation you are about to hear has been prepared by the company solely to provide you with general information of the company and its group and an overview of its operations. This presentation is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute an offer to sell or subscribe for securities. This presentation should not form the basis of any investment decision and should reach your own conclusions before making any such decision. Now, I would like to invite Maciej Wieczorek to start the corporate session. Good morning and good evening. It's a pleasure for me uh, that you are with us today during our first Capital Markets Day. My name is Maciej Wieczorek and I'm the founder, the CEO of the Salon Pharma company. I founded this business almost 20 years ago at the times where generic products represented great business opportunity. Benefiting from patent cliffs and not yet fully incorporated savings potential from generic products. But from the very beginning, it was my dream to be in the innovative business. And I wanted to, in fact, in the last two decades, this virus to the whole, to the entire company. So we started almost 20 years ago as a generic business with first few products introduced to the market. And starting from 2006, we started our first R&D department. We benefited from Poland joining EU and with that, we managed to co-finance our research and innovative program significantly. So today, most of our R&D programs are co-financed from EU funds. We have moved with our innovative pipeline and in the years 2010, 2014, we entered with first few compounds into preclinical and toxicology programs. In the same time, we didn't forget about generic business that is for us cash generator, but we moved into more complex generic products using sophisticated 
respiratory delivery with a particular focus on dry powder inhalation. And with this technology, we have introduced our first product, Salmex, today our major growth driver. It was introduced in 2013 on the market, and we have approved this product into many more European and out of European markets. So today, our major focus, more than 90% resources, go into innovation. We have several programs in both preclinical and clinical development, and five of them is in clinical development. To summarize our strategy, we have started from generic products, relatively easy to manufacture and develop, and we move into innovation, innovative programs. At the beginning, in innovative pipeline, we use small molecules, and we are expert now in many technologies using small molecules. We have very experienced medicinal chemistry team, but we are now moving more and we are using new technologies in designing our products, our drugs. And these are recombinant proteins, bispecifics, and mRNA technologies. And finally, we wanted to escape from being simply early product or early technology supplier into giving our more and more expertise in commercialization and product development into being for selective products in selective indications, marketer on the selective global markets. So all of this strategy is based to increase, to add the value to the shareholders. So we are on the verge of accelerated growth. We benefit from the competencies we have developed, both in commercialization of our branded generics and our discovery and development experience we have gained up to now. We know how to design our products to target unmet medical needs, and we look for products with blockbuster potential. Later, you can see that each of our product has the blockbuster status aiming between one to five billion sales peak sales. We are positioning our programs to, have to be best in class properties, and all of that can be achieved with very solid clinical development. So we are with five of our programs today in clinical stage, and we have first very robust readouts from our cl clinical program, and you can expect in the next couple of years to have more and more clinical readouts from phase two and likely phase three. The programs are designed to show clinical benefit, real cl clinical benefits for our patients. So we have very broad, late-stage clinical program in the next few years. Let's move about our key goals in the next five years. So our focus is innovation. We want to increase our R&D spending to double it within the next few years. Numerically, we want to advance at least two products per year into clinical development and advance at least two products into pivotal stage phase three development. Our Folkeri dry powder esketamine, we expect to be approved in the next few years in the major markets, US and EU, and we'll do that with our partners. We target to sign commercial agreements this year. We also target for two, at least two significant partnership agreements 
in the next few years for our other programs. We don't forget about our branded generic business. We want to expand that based on Salmex, Salmex success. And we have the plan for continuation of our geographical expansion. We have two markets that we think about that. It's China and US. And we have the planned strategy for each of these markets to develop and launch our products, Salmex product, in the next few years. So with all of that, we expect significant double-digit annual growth up to 2025. We will add some fuel into branded generics by adding few products in respiratory and neuropsychiatry field in the next few years. Jacek, please, your turn for the generics. Thank you, Maciej. Uh, my name is Jacek Glinka. I am responsible for commercial affairs and business development at Celon. Before that, I spent uh, more or less half of my previous professional life in the consulting industry. And then I moved, uh, I switched the sides. I moved to pharmaceutical industry where I have spent around 11 years with Paul Pharma, the largest Polish pharmaceutical company uh, uh, in the capacity mostly of the CEO. And then I moved uh, to Milan, where I have spent six years as president for Europe, at the same time being also responsible for uh, leading the Medicines for Europe, formerly known as the European Generics Association, in the role of president and vice president. Today, it's my pleasure to walk you through the generics business uh, quickly, because the focus of today is mostly on innovation, but uh, generic business uh, has built a cell on foundation to move into innovation. Uh, we started with the focused approach on the Polish market, uh, which was branded generic market at that time, where we have launched a few first to market important molecules. And subsequently, in 2013, with development of Salmex, we have moved to the overseas markets. And today, Salmex is our most important product, being responsible for around three quarters of the sales which totaled last year around 130 million zloty. Our approach to commercialization is uh, different for the local market and different for the overseas territories. In Poland, we have developed full commercial infrastructure to support our business with excellent coverage of physicians in relative uh, therapeutic areas as well as strong uh, marketing function. Thanks to that, you could see that our market share puts us in the leading position in relevant therapeutic areas, ranging from 8 to 64% for our second largest brand and 39% for our key brand, Salvex. In the overseas territories, so we have a different approach. We are working exclusively through the business partners who have relevant strength in the uh, relevant markets such as uh, Milan or Glenmark. We have started commercialization of Salmex in 2013 with the registration in Poland. Subsequently, we have moved to most important European markets and thereafter into the rest of the world. Today, we market this product in more than 20 countries. In another 20 plus countries, we are in the process of registration which means that we have created the first truly global product of the Polish pharmaceutical industry. Our export sales dropped a little in 2019. This was caused by the legal dispute with Glaxo um, over the intellectual property rights to, to Salmex, uh, which has uh, concluded with the settlement agreement in the first quarter of 2020. And since then, our our export sales uh, started to grow 300% year on year last year and has ach have achieved around 35 uh, million Polish zloty or 10 million US dollars. Indeed, we want to continue our 
geographical expansion with this product, we are, and we are expecting a double-digit CAGR in the next years to come. Our generic business is uh, vertical, vertically integrated. We have built the manufacturing and development capabilities in-house. As a result, all our generic products are manufacturing, man manufactured internally. And we have today, after the upscaling programs, uh, uh, built more than sufficient capacities to support current and future volume of, uh, of uh, uh, demand. Um, so, with this, we have been able over the last 20 years to develop many important strategic competences, such as uh, pharmaceutical development of different forms, such as uh, management of intellectual property and also GMP manufacturing for different dry forms as well as dry powder inhalers, which we are manufacturing in-house. It was also interesting for us with Salmex to learn about global regulatory landscape as well as build the global supply chain and finally we have built a commercial infrastructure, both branded infrastructure in Poland, as well as a network of different business partnerships around the globe that today not only support our generic business segment, but also build a foundation that is critical to support certain innovative programs. So with this, I'm asking Maciej back on stage to talk about the most important part of our business, which is innovation. Thank you very much, Jacek. So uh, I'm going to show you the uh, innovative business update to present you this update. So let me start with, uh, with the uh, highlights where we are, in which therapeutic areas we are in this innovative business. And we are in the same areas where we started our branded generics many, many years ago. So, uh, we built uh, competencies uh, today, uh, which are supported by uh, teams of uh, between 30 to 60 researchers and scientists in these uh, special therapeutic areas. And these areas resulted in uh, several preclinical and clinical assets uh, with five clinical programs uh, that I want to discuss in more details today. So let me start first with the most advanced assets. This is our Folkeri, Esketamine in dry powder inhaler, the program that has just completed phase two. And we have very good, uh, excellent uh, phase two readouts from our bipolar depression study. And this is our major indication that we want to move this agent forward However, bipolar, however, unipolar depression indication, the same as for Spravato, is also under ev evaluation. We have the first oral agent in, uh, in neuropsychiatry. This is a small molecule called CPL36. And we designed this molecule to improve on shortcomings of first generation PDA10A inhibitors. And later, I will show you that we have the molecule that, is, that has very clear best-in-class profile. So we are running two phase two studies in schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease, levodopa uh, induced dyskinesias. In metabolic diseases, we have, we have just completed phase one of our small molecule, GPR40 agonist, Many years ago, the molecular target was high expectations in diabetes type 2. 
But due to toxicity of first-generation agents, most of these programs were terminated. So we discovered molecules that have, uh, that have uh, improved on these shortcomings of first-generation GPR40 agonists. And this is CPR280. This molecule, we are just preparing to move it into phase two in these two indications. The one is diabetes type two, and the second is diabetic neuropathy. In oncology, we have the first targeted agent. This is CPL110, and our CPL110 is a small molecule that is FGFR inhibitor. This is very hot area in oncology, and we have very first very robust efficacy data of these inhibitors in many solid tumors. So we believe our inhibitor to have very good biodistribution properties will share significant market share in this attractive, uh, attractive disease, in these attractive markets. In inflammatory diseases, we have the first in class dual jack rock inhibitor that is in phase one, and this is also a very attractive asset that will be the topic with, for discussion with our key opinion leader. So let's move to Falkeri. As I said, we are very happy with and very excited with phase two bipolar depression readouts we have on hand. But first of all, we want to show you that we, ha we, are, we have clear differentiation, different profile of our Falkeri to first agent approved, to first product approved with esketamine that is called Spravato from J&J. &J. First of all, we use different administration. We use dry powder, pulmonary administration. And with this administration, we consistently see much more predictable pharmacokinetics. So this more predictable pharmacokinetics can give us, can translate into more precise dosing and potentially can translate into better tolerable agents. And our very initial readouts from phase two may suggest that particularly in bipolar depression, uh, respiratory administration is giving very good, very clean safety profile. So as I said, we are developing our molecule and this was a little bit risky approach but the approach that today give us to be, to be on the leader position, because we hypothesize that esketamine can be effective and safe in bipolar depression. And bipolar depression, as we know, is consisting of manic phase, psychotic phase, and depressive phase. So uh, psychometric agents like Ketamine as ketamine theoretically may induce mania, may increase the risk of psychotic state of the patient with exacerbation of mania. So it was some kind of risk, but later today, during our key opinion session, you will see that we are not inducing mania. We are even improving mania in the course of the treatment. So this is new data. Uh, very impressive data, which position this molecule in treatment-resistant bipolar depression as potentially agent of choice. Of course, provided that we can replicate our phase two readouts in the phase three studies. So we have completed two phase two studies with bipolar depression, having very robust efficacy and very good safety data. There is one more difference between our development, Falkeri to Spravato. We are incorporating to our inhaler uh, some electronic device that ultimately, and this will be in the life cycle of this product, may give us chances to have a knot of this product in the home setting by self-administration of patients in the maintenance treatment of the disease. 
So if we get that, we'll have real huge competitive advantage over the other ketamine or esketamine administration that must be used both acutely and chronically in the clinics. So we are working on that and later in development, in clinical development, uh, we are going to show you this data. Let me come back to the rationale behind this product development. So you know that uh, we have huge expertise in respiratory technologies. So we leverage on that in designing and developing our Falkiri device. We achieve very high, very high lung deposition efficiency, and it means that a large part of the drug is uh, administered to the lungs, not gastrointestinal tract, not other parts of the body, but to the lungs where absorption takes place. And we achieve efficiency of lung deposition around 50%. And today, industry standard is around 20-30%. We achieve that with consistent delivery. So with this CMC and product development strong data, we started phase one in healthy volunteers. And on this slide, you can see our PK profile. And this profile show us that we achieve the same drug plasma exposure using much lower nominal doses. So it means that our product is, has higher bioavailability. And we calculated that we have higher bioavailability in comparison to intranasal spravato formulation between 30 to 45%. So of course that's good, because it means better safety. We can also see much lower intrasubject variability. So again, it may translate into better safety profile. We have first, with this phase one and good safety profile, we initiated two proof of concept phase two studies, one in treatment resistant unipolar depression and the second in new indication not yet touched by anybody in treatment-resistant bipolar depression. In treatment-resistant unipolar depression, we could see some signal of efficacy, most pronoun mostly pronounced at the highest dose, but we didn't achieve statistical significance. However, in treatment-resistant bipolar depression, we had very robust efficacy data with the primary endpoint to be statistically significant and clinically meaningful. We achieve effect size of around between 0.8 to 1.4. This is large to very large. For me, not yet seen in any bipolar depression studies. We can see also some better safety profile in bipolar depression study in comparison to in unipolar depression study, our study, but also when we indirectly compare our safety data to what can be seen in transforms Pravato phase three studies. So bipolar depression is our major indication and we move as a first indication, we move forward with this indication. So this is also very attractive indication. It is less prevalent, but later today, I think our expert will discuss a real prevalence that is much higher than statistics say. So uh, many more patients have uh, bipolar depression than uh, are diagnosed. We have very few approved treatments in bipolar depression, and we have only four antipsychotics approved in US and one in the EU. Of course, psychiatrists treat bipolar depression that is highly debilitating disease with many different class of drugs. Particularly, they use anticonvulsant drugs. But for sure, this is the setting, clinical setting, with huge unmet need, and there are no any 
modality that showed consistent effect in treatment resistant setting. And we can see the peak sales of our product in this setting in treatment resistant bipolar depression that was estimated by independent research company to be around 1.3 billion that is of uh, USD that is almost double this peak sales of our product in unipolar depression the setting with much more therapeutic options, we have approved more than 30 antidepressants in different classes in this treatment. And antidepressants, albeit slowly, but works in majority of patients. And of course, we have Spravato approved in this indication, so uh, we expect Spravato to be market leader in unipolar depression for the many, many years from now. So let's move to the second phase two agent. This is phosphodiesterase 10A inhibitor. And again, we had the first generation uh, compounds that uh, delivered mixed results from phase two. The closest to achieve statistical significance in schizophrenia were compounds from Takeda called TAC-063. However, today we know more and more about the pharmacodynamics of phosphodiesterase 10A inhibitor. So we believe our agents bypass the limitations and drawbacks of first generation agents. And I will show you why we believe is that. First of all, our molecule is chemically different to both MP10 from Pfizer and TAC-063. It has superior pharmacodynamic profile and today it means that we should have very fast off from the enzyme. And when we compare dissociation from the enzyme, and this is the table on the right, you can see our agent has few to several times faster dissociation from the enzyme. And with that, the agent's inhibition of phosphodiesterase A is focusing on the indirect pathway responsible for antipsychotic effect. And if we are for too long binding to the enzyme, we can, we can uh, start signaling of direct pathway and compensate this antipsychotic effect. So our agent with this pharmacodynamic profile is best in class. It has the fastest dissociation from the enzyme. No wonder we can see much more robust preclinical efficacy and safety profile in almost all animal studies that we test and we compare our CPL36 with both Takeda and MP10 compounds. Of course, the general uh, expectation from the class of these drugs, it's, uh, it's no metabolic or hyperplactinemia risk. Today, major limitations for chronic long-term use of antipsychotics. And also we have phase one in healthy volunteers. So with this phase one, again, give us very good pharmacokinetic profile. And here on the left, you have two figures showing our pharmacokinetics to be linear at the tested doses between one to 60 milligram and it's after day one, day seven, and day 14, we achieve after once daily administration, the plateau of the exposure to be uh, at around day four. And with a dose 40 milligram per patient once daily, we achieve the, uh, the exposure, the AUC to be around of 6,000, six fold uh, uh, greater then was achieved by Takeda compound at the dose, nominal dose 20 milligram, the dose tested in phase two. So we believe we can move up to ceiling with the exposure, with the target inhibition. Not it tested by any first generation PDA10A inhibitor. And one of the reasons why was that is because Takeda and also MP10 are in the pharmacokinetics imperfect. So you can see in nonlinear pharmacokinetics, and you, when you add the dose more than 30, 40 milligram, you have the plateau of drug exposure. 
And some side effects were also uh, presented with the high doses. So I think this PK profile with our molecule is superior and it can add the confidence that we can see the effect in our phase two proof of concept studies. So we started two of such studies, one in acute schizophrenia in around 165 patients. We test two doses, 20 milligram and 40 milligram once daily. We administered for four weeks with the PANS positive subscale as a primary endpoint at week four. And the second study, not yet tested by any company, is levodopa induced dyskinesias in Parkinson's disease. So we are planning to randomize around 110 patients at two doses, 20 and 40 milligram, again administer our product once weekly for four weeks, with the primary endpoint to be United uh, Dyskinesia Rating Scale at week two. The readouts from both studies should be available in the first half of next year. Let's talk about the markets. Of course, schizophrenia is a huge market, but we are treating patients with generic products. The market is still uh, uh, in very, very, very sizable in, in value terms. It's around $10 billion. It's mostly driven by few still under patents agents or extended release forms or uh, you know, uh, some, some delivery systems that are used uh, uh, to increase the convenience for the patients. But it is very, uh, very undertreated disease and there are still lots of uh, poorly addressed, addressed uh, parts of the, or domains of these diseases. So these are, these are negative and cog cognitive symptoms, but also almost all of our today use atypical antipsychotics uh, carry some tolerability issues with weight gain, with metabolic impairments or with movement disorders. So once we have the product that is at least similarly effective to the currently used antipsychotics and, and free from these side effects, we believe it will have lots of advantages on the market and grab significant market share here. L Levodopa induced dyskinesias is even more a uh, disease with even more unmet medical needs. So we are using mostly amantadine here, generic amantadine. There are some form proprietary extended release formulation, but more than 90% of the prescriptions ca go, uh, comes from generic amantadine. So the market is huge, around half of patients after 10 years of levodopa administration present the side effects. And levodopa today is the gold standard. I cannot imagine, and neurologists or psychiatrists cannot imagine to change that, to, to, to substitute that with the other drug, because simply levodopa is very effective. But these dyskinesias that are starting after a few years are something that are real, consists of real therapeutic challenge. So this is very attractive area. And today there are a few other companies that have in phase two other programs. So let's go to metabolic diseases and our most advanced program. And as I said, this is very uh, attractive novel GPR-40 agonies. For all of you that uh, are uh, in diabetes, you probably remember a few years ago, GPR-40 had high expectations as a new class of drugs. It has very simple mechanism of action, very similar to sulfonylurea. So it releases insulin, but in contrary to sulfonylureas that release insulin independent of glucose level, we have the glucose-dependent insulin release when GPR-40 agonists are used. So with this property, we can see consistently much less hypoglycemia risk. And this is a nightmare when using sulfonylureas, very effective agents, but associated with several percent of the hypoglycemia risk, that sometimes may be even fatal. 
So the rationale to develop GPR40 agonies was to, to uh, deliver agent with the very, very simple mechanism with the release of insulin, but without this hypoglycemia risk. However, the first generation molecules were found to be hepatotoxic. And for many years, we didn't know why they, are, they were hepatotoxic. Today, we know that this is the combination of the very strong bile acids in transporters inhibition and also some biodistribution, particularly for fasciglifan. So when we compare the most important properties with our agents to the, to, the, to the properties that are responsible for the liver injury risk, we can see in each of the property that we are on the safe side. We have an order of magnitude lower inhibition of bile acid transporters measured by IC50. On the left is our molecule, on the right is Fasiglifam. The highest value is better. And we have also, we have different, better biodistribution. And this is the central figure. You can see that our molecule has the exposure in plasma mostly, not liver, in contrary to fasciglifam that is accumulated in the liver. So inhibiting of bile acids transporters with this, high, with this very high liver concentration then result in this hepatotoxicity risk. We are also much safer on almost all of the hepatotocytes. So this has give us very confident picture from the cell and ex vivo experiments that we should be safe when we have, when we analyze hepatotoxicity risk. And this was supported in animal studies in toxicology studies and also in our phase one program that was, has the special focus on liver enzymes, bilirubin and other hepatotoxic risk parameters. So we don't see any risk safety signals here in our phase one program. Of course, it's still small studies with few weeks of drug administration, but we must remember that for the fasciglifam, we, had, we, we could see the ALT and AST increase levels in around 4 to 5 percent of patients. And this increases started early after administration. So it's really good we cannot see any of that in our preclinica, high dose tox studies, and also phase one study. So we move this agent forward into diabetes type 2. And the indication that is completely new, and it is, uh, we are the first company to show with these GPR40 oral agonies to be effective in uh, diabetic neuropathy. So where we are from the market point of view, of course, diabetes type 2 is huge market. But in the same time, we have many therapeutic options. We have two stars. This is GLP-1 and SGLT-2. And these agents are effective. They have some safety issues, but they have something that is now very important. It is called benefit beyond glucose control. And when we talk with the uh, 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 endocrinologists and, uh, and physicians that treat diabetes, all of them say sulfonylureas are great agents. They are very effective, but there is hypoglycemia risk. And we know that. And there is some weight gain risk. The patients on average uh, have two to three kgs of weight gain. And at the end, particularly with the uh, introduction of GLP-1 and SGLT-2, sulfonylureas uh, don't have this benefit beyond glucose control. Of course, we know that most of sulfonylureas are generic products. So there is no any incentives for these companies to invest heavily into the programs, large clinical programs, to show the evidence of that. Maybe they are, but our molecule is perfectly fit because it addresses all of the side effects and challenges of 
with sulfonylureas. It has very plastic mechanism of action, and it will be, we believe, very easily to convince physicians to prescribe our drugs because they'll be simply much better sulfonylureas, not carrying the risk and uh, you know, uh, leveraging on the uh, effect of uh, insulin release that they remember from sulfonylureas. So we believe our agents have chances to substitute sulfonylureas, and this is still a very large market. It's not as large and with not as much pot potential as GLP-1 or SGLT-2, but today around $7 billion are spent on sulfonylureas. The market of sulfonylureas is, un is, is, uh, is not growing much, but this is mostly because, as I said, there are newer agents with these benefits beyond glucose control. And with our diabetic neuropathy indication, we think that this may be benefit that can give us very clear positioning of our product in patients having inadequate control after metformin and presenting diabetic neuropathy. So let's go, let's move to oncology. And in oncology, we have the first FGFR inhibitor targeted agent that we develop in gastric, bladder, and squamous non-small cell lung cancer. Today, this product and its environment will be in detail discussed with our key opinion leader, Professor Holostowska. So I'm going to highlight you where we are with this program. So first of all, this is a very attractive, hot area, and we have Recently, we have learned about clinical evidence of first agents in different tumors. So we are in phase 1-1-B, and we want to move into phase 2 next year with this agent. We target gastric, bladder, and non-small cell lung squamous cancer. And these are huge tumors with, with huge unmet needs. However, the market, the landscape is a little bit changing in bladder cancer due to immunotherapy. And immunotherapy today, uh, mostly PDL1, we observe the response rate in advanced metastatic setting of around 20-25%. That is lower for erdafitinib, J and J FGFR inhibitor, that showed response rate of 30 few percent. So once you have the good preselected patients having genetic aberrations of FGFR, as you can see, you can achieve huge response rate. So we have also very early phase two study in gastric cancer with the monoclonal antibody targeting FGFR, and this antibody showed the benefit that was increased when the patients presented more overexpression of FGFR2 kinase receptor. So it's again giving us some confidence that good preselection of patients, but patients that can respond to the treatment may yield with the, uh, with the excellent uh, clinical benefit. Non-small cell lung cancer is very attractive and we know it's one of the most prevalent tumor. However, we are targeting squamous histology that is, uh, that is presented in around 20% of patients and we see genetic aberrations of FGFR in non-small cell lung squamous cancer in around 20% of patients. So we are targeting the market of potentially a few billion dollars. So this is the last, our clinical stage asset, and this is very attractive molecule. It's the first in class dual jack rock inhibitor that, has, that was designed to have both anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic properties. And JAK inhibitors are well known today, and they are, we see the growth of these molecules. They are in many autoimmune diseases, show very robust effect, similar to many biologicals like TNF-alpha. But all of them are, are probably related to some of the risk. And we know about tefacitinib to have this risk, cardiovascular risk. We also know that autoimmune diseases are, are at p p patients with autoimmune disease, almost all of autoimmune disease, are 
at excessive cardiovascular risk. This risk is increased by 30 to 70 percent of 70 percent. So it would be great to have effective anti-inflammatory agent with the CV protection property. And rock kinases is well validated CV protection targets. We know this is the one of the one of the mechanisms that is used by statins and their cardiovascular protection. We know the agents that target ROC has beneficial cardiovascular protection properties. So we designed our molecule to have both this dual inhibition and we target many autoimmune diseases. These simple diseases like psoriasis or uh, RA, but in patients with increased cardiovascular risk. But we could also see potential of this molecule in autoimmune diseases that requires both anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic activity. And this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary arterial hypertension, or intestinal lung disease in the course of many autoimmune diseases with a special focus on RA. So very attractive agents with many potential uh, clinical settings, first in class, and we go uh, forward with this agent, we expect in the next two to three months to initiate many phase two proof of concept studies in these indications. So let me start with the plaque psoriasis. We know it's a huge market. Today quite well served by interleukin-17 and interleukin-27 monoclonal antibodies. But in the same time, we know that there is a very uh, moderately effective Otesla that has the market size of around 3 billion. And this is the only oral agent approved in psoriasis. So we think that there is a huge need to have the efficacy better than Otesla and be administered orally to grab significant part of this market. In RA, we are mostly focusing on RA with intestinal lung disease. And we know several percent of patients are presenting this intestinal lung disease. So we think that this is a very attractive market. We know JAK inhibitors are doing well in this market. And the market size of JAK inhibitors in RA today is around $3 billion, with the expectations to, uh, to, grew to, to grow to $7 billion in the next couple of years. And finally, we have two indications that are attractive. This is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We know there are two agents approved today. This is SBIT. And this is uh, uh, OFEV and uh, the market size of around $3 billion growing. <coughs> <I'm sorry. coughs> and we have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Again, very large market, $7 billion. Very well served, but still with many agents, but still uh, there are more combinations combinations now, now under development and there, are, there is a room for other effective drugs in pulmonary arterial hypertension. These two diseases, IPF and PAH, are diseases with a very bad prognosis. It has not changed much. Uh, 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 life expectations to be around three to five years, one diagnosing, one diagno patient diagnosed with this with this um, disease. So this is our clinical trials news flow. And as you can see, uh, as you can see, uh, we are going to, sh to announce to you many readouts from our phase one and phase two in the next quarters. Uh, we are just finishing for Kiri, treatment resistant bipolar depression, longer term observation uh, results. We are preparing with Falkiri. Uh, briefing package and to go to both FDA and EMA and ask for phase three program. Uh, in with GPR40, uh, in this quarter we'll we'll start uh, our phase two uh, in diabetes and next quarter in diabetic neuropathy. In CPO 116, in the next quarter, we plan to initiate few proof of concept studies. And next year, uh, you'll s you, you, should s you should see readouts from our PDA 10A, Jack Rock, and we'll initiate 
FGFR two phase two program. So every quarter you should see from us many news from our clinical pipeline. So we are really on the verge of accelerated growth and we leverage on competences we had so far in both commercialization of our branded generics, but also we know how to design and develop the molecules that are properly selected for unmet medical needs. And we are trying to have best in class profile of our molecules. All of that is tested in well-designed clinical studies that should show real clinical benefits for our patients. So we have very broad pipeline and we expect to have impressive results from this pipeline, at least for some of our programs in the next years. Good afternoon. My name is Ivona Giedronowicz and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Salon Pharma. At the beginning, I'd like to show you some key facts and figures related to the financial results. I would also like to mention that uh, as of the beginning of 2021, we are using international accounting standards so the numbers I'm going to present reflect that and them. First, I want to describe Celon's Pharma financing model. With the revenue of over 138 million in 2020, the branded generics business has allowed us to invest in very expensive, innovative business as cost of R&D only in 2020 came to almost 53 million. We are currently running 15 R&D projects with five in the clinical stage of development. And we have received government grants to fund all of them. So far, we used almost 100 million, but we have also been granted additional over three, uh, 350 million in government subsidies which uh, will be used in the future. All of those uh, are not non-dilutive and non-refundable. During the last three years, we have spent over 200 million finalizing over 95% uh, of on R&D center construction. However, we are not ante anticipating more large capital expenditure in the near future. We want to continue this uh, model covering between uh, 60 and 75% of the annual R&D costs by the grants and the generic business. Next is the company operations divided into the branded generics business and innovative business. Here you have uh, following indicators, uh, revenues, expenses and EBITDA. The brand generic sales EBITDA, which in 2020 came to over 55 million, compensated the EBITDA loss from the innovation business. As you can see, the, companies, the company is um, reinvesting the profits from the operation uh, business to generate more profit in the future. Although we have well running balanced business, we are also aware of many problems. We want to lead more projects into the second stage of, de of development and then to continue them in the first, third stage. All of this is very money consuming. Please note that the third stage of all of our projects is not, not going to be supported by any subsidies. 
The following information is on profit and loss. The growing depreciation and amortization reflect how much has been invested in the last year. The R&D costs reflect work in progress and the uh, export sales show strong growth. Moving on the balance sheet, I'd like to point out that the great increase in the value of uh, the tangible assets uh, is due to R&D center construction with its equipment. In 2020, we acquired a license that will allow us to increase our sales, uh, particularly in the uh, export market. It has also led to an increase in current and non-current liabilities. At the end of uh, 2020, those figures were 5.1 million and 24.8 and, uh, million, respectively. Uh, the decrease in the equity stake in other entities is due to the financial assessment of uh, Mabion on the stock market. As you probably know, the situation has changed and the value bounced back. The construction of uh, the R&D center resulted in a decline in net cash flow from 144 million in 2018 to 80.5 million in 2020. At the end of my presentation, I'd like to emphasize that Salon Pharma's focus is on developing the R&D projects. We have a strong branded generics business, but going forward, we want to focus more and more on our innovation business. Thank you very much. I pass the floor of Mongosha. Thank you. Now we will move uh, forward to Kaiola's session. Uh, this time we will use the benefits of modern technologies to connect two parts of um, uh, the globe and discuss the first therapeutic uh, area planned for today. This part of the conversation was pre-recorded just before uh, our event and the interviews were conducted by Piotr Wierzbiński, psychiatrist. And now this is my great pleasure to invite you for watching it. Piotr Wierzbiński and his first guest straight from Barcelona and Texas. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Piotr Wierzbiński. I'm medical doctor and philosophy doctor, and I am psychiatrist. I have 16 years of experience in treating patients with various mental disorder, and I have a great pleasure to conduct a session with key opinion leaders of today's event, which for me is also a great scientific adventure. The late motive of our today's meeting will be to discuss an unmet medical needs in various therapeutic areas, including neuropsychiatry, which is a field that is particularly close to me. We will also discuss issues in the area of oncology and inflammatory diseases. Today there is a huge dose of knowledge ahead of us and meeting with international experts. During the meeting, in addition to talking to experts, I will share with you the perspective that is the most important to me from the point of view of the existing unmet medical needs. So, first of all, we start from neuropsychiatry. Very exciting. It will be very exciting for us because I will show you that psychiatry could be incredible uh, for non-psychiatrists. We have two distinguished guests on our board, Professor Eduard Vieta from University of Barcelona. Good afternoon, Professor Vieta. Thank you, and um, I'm keen to answer any questions. And Professor Jair Soares from Houston, from University of Texas. 
Good afternoon, Professor Soares. Well, uh, it's my, my pleasure to be able to participate in the recording today. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for inviting me. Now we will talk about psychiatry. We will talk about epidemiology, about um, treatment in psychiatry, especially we focus on unipolar and bipolar disorder. So, Professor Vieta, the first question to you is an uh, important thing, I think so, for every clinician. Given the lack of reliable biomarkers in psychiatry, how do you diagnose depression in bipolar disorder, also given these times of pandemic? So in the case of bipolar disorder, it is very complex to do the diagnosis in these times of pandemic, but also out of the pandemic, because we rely on the information that the patient and the family sometimes can give us. And this is subject to a lot of subjectivity from the uh, physician who does the interview. I totally agree with you, but there is a growing evidence to suggest that bipolar disorder depression is underdiagnosed. What can you tell me about the real life prevalence of this condition? Yes, I think that bipolar disorder is extremely prevalent, uh, even though when using the term cross-sectionally, only one in eight uh, depressions are officially bipolar. In fact, uh, important studies like the Bridge study and others done by these authors show that if you use the right screening tools and, and you do confirmation, up to 50% of patients with depression could be considered bipolar. So this means that this condition is extremely prevalent and that uh, there are a lot of unmet needs as regards to diagnosis and treatment as well. Okay, thank you, Professor Vieta. Let's switch to Professor Soares. Uh, Professor Soares, I know that you are in Houston. In Houston, I'm sure that the weather is better than in Poland. Uh, but let's focus on our topic. So how do you define treatment-resistant depression? And how do you define treatment-resistant bipolar depression? Uh, because for me, it's a very important question. As a clinician, I always have a problem with these patients. So what should be the optimal therapeutic approach in this setting? Well, most commonly defined as having failed a couple of different medications, you know, like given for a proper time and uh, you know, at, at, at the proper doses as well. And for bipolar patients or patients where there is a risk they might be bipolar, you try not to use uh, antidepressants. So usually what you do, you try to optimize the mood stabilizer dose first. If they're on lithium, you adjust the dose, or if they are like on, on lamotrigine or some of the other atypical antipsychotics. You, so, so treatment resistant is defined as having tried a couple of different treatments. Sometimes it is antidepressants are on that list, you know? And, and then you have to do it carefully because there is a risk they may, that may trigger a hypomanic or, or manic phase, as you know. Thank you, Professor Soares. Let's move quickly to Barcelona. Everyone appreciates the very good med Mediterranean weather in Barcelona. So, Professor Vieta, what is the main problem with how the bipolar depression is being treated nowadays? The, the main problem is that uh, many doctors still apply the paradigm for unipolar as for bipolar. And, and then they are used to try to uh, push the patient out of depression very quickly. But bipolars are like a pendulum. If you push from one side, then it goes to the other side and gets back even stronger on the other side. So we flying to Houston, Professor Soares. One of the key advantages of esketamine is its speed of action. Do you see a place of this therapy in the bipolar depression setting? And how does it compare with what we have available right now. 
very much so. That would be a major advance. You know, the, the speed uh, of action is very important because the, these medications we use now, it takes usually two, three weeks or longer. So, you know, something that works faster would be uh, very important, a real improvement. And primarily, if it is a treatment that, uh, you know, the data shows, shows that it's not increasing the chances of uh, hypomania or, or mania, that, that would be a uh, very important uh, improvement uh, upon what we have now. Okay, Professor Soares, so can you give us your thoughts on Salon's phase two data that showed that esketamine inhalation has significant positive impact uh, in treatment-resistant bipolar depression, which obviously in, is the area of high unmet medical need. Well, and then early data, you know, uh, uh, with uh, like phase two data showing that uh, it helped uh, with bipolar depression. That's very exciting. Professor Soares, we clinicians know that treatment-resistant depression is the area of high unmet need. So seeing the study results being so strong with effect size of up to 1.4 gives us hopes that we may soon have a useful addition to our therapeutic toolbox. Would you have any other comments on the study design and how to interpret these results? Very true. And, and that's where, you know, the effect, the, the effect size you mentioned is very impressive. These trials are always, you know, in comparison to what you've seen with placebo, because for some studies, for whatever reason, the placebo rates can be high, you know, people responding to the placebo. So you want to show that your medication is adding, you know, to that. It's not at the level that the placebo is. And the other concern is it's sometimes, you know, you just look at the, the numbers in this scale and uh, let's say improvement in like one or two points in this scale. Is that really clinically meaningful? That's why, uh, you know, looking at the effect size is, is so important. As you know, if, if you have a trial where the uh, the sample is just so large, perhaps a trivial difference will end up showing up as uh, statistically significant, but it may not be clinically significant. But, you know, the, the, the phase two trial, the data that I've seen, uh, you know, is, is uh, very impressive. It's properly powered, and uh, that effect size shows that it beats possible by a very substantial margin. The tolerability looks good as well. And it is a big market in an area of unmet need, for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we go back to Barcelona and we have an important question for Professor Vieta. Professor Vieta, was it a surprise to you to see such good results for esketamine in phase two study in treatment-resistant bipolar depression? To be, to be honest, it didn't come as a surprise to me uh, because, as mentioned, I was already expecting very good results in uh, bipolar depression. Um, I think what was important to, was to make sure that the compound uh, was uh, as equivalent to uh, other forms of esketamine. And as far as this is accomplished, then esketamine works, uh, should work in bipolar depression and this is why I think these positive results are very likely to uh, be replicated in a phase three study. So, given the excellent phase two study results for Falkieri, Falkieri is a trademark for respiratory esketamine. Uh, so, given the excellent phase two study results for Falkieri in bipolar depression, is there any neurobiological rationale why esketamine? should be more efficacious in bipolar depression as compared with unipolar depression? Yes, I think that it is likely to be more effective in bipolar depression than unipolar. And the reason is that under the umbrella of unipolar depression, we have a mixture of conditions. The, 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 we question in general, but this is a, a bunch of people some of them having a, a true uh, neurobiological illness and others having uh, you know, adverse conditions in life, disappointments and other problems. 
social problems that cause some uh, some suffering, of course, but which is biologically different. Whereas for bipolar depression, there is more homogeneity because we know that they all have been manic or hypomanic in the past, and we know that their depressions have a strong neurobiological uh, background. So uh, these people are not so likely to have placebo response such as unit of depression, and they are more likely to respond to a biological treatment such as esketamine, in my opinion. Thank you, Professor Vieta, for your excellent answer. But now that we have the phase two study results available, what would you be looking for in the phase three study in terms of how this drug works and how it is tolerated, especially given the risk of switching to mania or hypomania? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some switching and I wouldn't care if this is a small amount of patients because it happens with, with any treatment. Uh, what, what is really important is, even though now the results are very good, what is really important is that the results are replicated in terms of efficacy and speed of onset. Because if, if there is some switching, okay, that's fine. Uh, it's not such a big deal. Of course, I, I prefer if it, there is zero switching into mania. But the most important thing to me is that uh, the efficacy and the speed of onset is replicated. Professor Vieta, Professor Soares, thank you for your time and thank you for being today with us. Thank you all so and much. Thank you very much. With me is Celon Pharma CEO and founder, Maciej Wieczorek, PhD. And can you give us your thoughts about phase two study results in treatment resistant bipolar depression? Thank you very much, Piotr. So we had introduction uh, with high expectations of esketamine in bipolar depression. I hope we will deliver in our phase two proof of concept study. So to remind you, we have designed this study as a double blind placebo controlled uh, in around 90 patients. The patients uh, were qualified, those who had inadequate response to at least two previous uh, treatments. So we had both patients on uh, antipsychotics and anticonvulsants, um, and the patients were treated uh, with our Falkeri esketamine dry powder inhaler twice weekly over two weeks. We had primary endpoint to be Madras improvement of a placebo at week two, and we randomized patients with both types of bipolar depression, type one presenting mania, and type 2 presenting hypomania. So we had the data set of the patients that uh, can be easily found in the day-to-day -day practice of bipolar depression. So this is the primary endpoint of the study and the top-line results of this study were announced two months ago. So we can see very robust efficacy of our product uh, with the Madras improvement of a placebo between six to eight units. And this is the difference that is statistically significant and clinically meaningful. So when you look, look at this data, you can see also some uh, trends in those. So that's good. And we have seen very large effect size between 0 0.8 to 1.4 that is increasing with the dose increase. So primary endpoint was met, and this is impressive. Uh, in my uh, practice, in my research practice, I have never seen such large effect size in bipolar depression. We have also confirmation of the effect of the drug uh, from secondary endpoints. So as you can see on the slide, we have improvements in both response that is defined as more than 50% improvement in a Madras scale, and almost half of our patients remitted at week two. So again, it's uh, very rarely seen that the uh, res remission comes such quickly and in such large amount of patients. So uh, this secondary endpoint that is also supported by, uh, by the second depression scale 
Hamilton scale that we use in our in our study, all of them are supporting our primary endpoint, showing a robust effect of the drug in this study. Just to give you how we compare to the other products that were approved, on this slide you can see the placebo subtracted difference on Madras, and with that we can see the response comparison between Farcari on the left, and you can see that the placebo subtracted response, response on Falkiri to be between 40 to, uh, to almost 60 percent, and that compares very favorable to approved treatments with quetiapine or olanzapine with fluoxetine to be around 20, 20 few percent, and recently approved agents like lurazidone and cariprazine. You have the uh, responses, uh, placebo subtractive responses of around 10 to several percent. And the same is with remission. So here we can see also two to threefold higher uh, remission in comparison to, uh, to uh, approved agents, uh, quetiapine, olanzapine, and lurazidone, cariprazine. It's worth it to know that in two, in, uh, two uh, agents recently approved, lurazidone and uh, cariprazone, treatment-resistant patients were excluded in phase three. So it gives even more power to effect that we can see in our study. Thank you, Mr. President. It was very exciting. It was a very exciting session. And neuropsych, I think that we showed you that psychiatry could be very exciting. And I think that um, esketamine could be very important drug in the psychiatry because the esketamine is a very quick of action. Start of action is very quick because usually we need wait for the antidepressants drugs. We have changed the paradigm of treatment because we, usually in our normal practice, we use SSRIs or SNRIs, who inhibits the noradrenaline transport to the neurons, serotonin, and increase the serotonin and the dopamine in the brain. But now we have esketamine, who change everything, because it's the mechanism of action is quite different, and it's a quick time from the table to the one set, or from the respiratory session to the one set. So I think that we show you that psychiatry could be exciting and that maybe we need, of course, I'm sure that we need the future researchers about esketamine because it could, be, it could resolve the unmet medical need in psychiatry, especially in the treatment resistant uh, problems with unipolar and bipolar depression. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vieta. Thank you, Professor Soares. It was excellent session for me and for you also, I think so. And our next session is oncology. Uh, oncology is a very important part for Celon Pharma. Welcome. It's me once again. I'm Piotr Wierzbiński, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a medical doctor and philosophy doctor, and we are in Celon Pharma headquarters. And with me is Professor Chorostowska Wynimko, yeah. one of the best pulmonologists what I have ever met in my <laughs> life. And still with me is Mr. President Maciej Wieczorek, CEO Celon of Celon Pharma. And now we talk about oncology because we know that one of the first innovative programs started within company uh, was FGF, uh, FR inhibitor in targeted treatment of cancer. Today, this field is very hot with many clinical programs running and first agents approved recently. And we have Professor Horostowska with us because Professor Horostowska is an ideal person to talk about combining new diagnostic techniques for patients' preselections with FGFR receptor treatment. Professor, let me start to ask why 
FGFR genetic aberrations might be a valid therapeutic strategy? Well, indeed, uh, oncology is recently a um, very rapidly progressing field in medicine and mostly due to the fact that we have understood the importance of targeted treatments in oncology. It's much more effective and allows us uh, really to change the natural history of uh, many cancers. That includes also FGFRs. Uh, this is a signaling axis that uh, has been known as uh, crucial for um, um, normal development of, uh, <clears throat> of organs, of, um, uh, of vasculature and uh, skeletal uh, structure of the body. However, now we understand also that it's important for development of number of cancers. And uh, this is due to the fact that this is the signaling that is crucial for cancer cells um, development, differentiation, um, growth, and also survival. So all those features that are very uh, strongly linked to the cancer um, oncology per se. Um, the family of uh, fibroblastic, fibro fibroblast growth factor um, is uh, a group of, um, of four receptors and as many as 18 uh, ligands. All those receptors are highly conserved transmembrane um, uh, kinase um, uh, receptors that uh, um, are important in um, cancer-linked signaling due to the uh, number of aberrations and mostly due to the fact um, that, uh, as we know now, uh, there could be mutations, there could be translocations and also gene amplifications that uh, uh, result in uh, um, gain of function changes and subsequently in uh, cancer development. Those are so-called driving mutations for, uh, for many cancers. Among those, uh, the cancers with higher incidence of FGFR aberrations are uh, lung cancer, mostly squamous lung cancer, uh, with uh, um, amplification of uh, receptor 1 um, as high as 17%. Uh, gastric cancer with amplification of receptor 2, uh, close to 10%, and also bladder cancer with the number of mutation in receptor, uh, in receptor 3. Uh, our current experience with targeted therapies in oncology also proves that it's not only important to uh, understand the um, mechanistics of uh, of driver mutation, but also uh, to be able to properly identify, select the uh, patients who would respond to the therapy. For that, we need a very uh, well-chosen biomarkers. Those biomarkers allow us to indeed identify those patients who potentially would respond to the, to the treatment, and that could be achieved uh, at different levels, starting from the protein via RNA down to uh, DNA, uh, isolated from the tumor cells, but also uh, different techniques could be used. So essentially, in order to uh, have efficient therapy, it's not only important to have the molecule, but also to identify the proper, um, proper diagnostic method, method that would allow us to uh, indeed apply the treatment to the uh, most responsive patients. For that, uh, in terms of uh, FGFR axis, uh, different techniques could be um, uh, used dependently on the, uh, on the uh, targeted aberration of FGFR. So as you can see, uh, we could either use the uh, wide range um, um, scanning, uh, NGS, uh, we could uh, target the RNA, RNA level as well as protein level or with, for example, immunohistochemistry. Indeed, in our clinical research, we decided to uh, specifically address this question. Uh, so not only to develop the molecule, but also to develop the 
most specific and most effective uh, method of patient selection and therefore the companion diagnostic test development within the trial, very specifically targeting the uh, aberration um, uh, linked to the given uh, cancer. So for lung cancer, we, uh, we uh, aimed at looking at the efficacy of um, fish uh, fluorescent in, in, in situ hybridization uh, to identify FGFR1 amplification, but also at the uh, protein via immunohistochemistry. In gastric cancer, again, we, we used fish and immunohistochemistry techniques uh, to identify aberration in receptor 2. And finally, in blood cancer, uh, mutation uh, is uh, mutations uh, are the target for the multi tough uh, mass spectrometry, but also again protein uh, via immunohistochemistry. Uh, Therefore, we hope to achieve uh, the, let's say, ideal, ideal setup of uh, uh, identifying the patient with highest efficacy. And this is, uh, this is the fact that, that has been proven but, but by many clinical trials. The more specific, the more effective diagnostic method, uh, the higher efficacy of properly chosen molecule. Mr. President, Dr. Maciej Wieczorek still with us. Uh, Mr. President, I have a question, I think important question for our participants. Uh, we have few other FGFR inhibitors in clinical development. What we know about CPL116 and how this compares to the other inhibitors? Uh, well, actually, FGFR, our CPL100, 10 was uh, um, not an easy molecule to uh, discover. Uh, this is kinase inhibitor, so with all of kinase inhibitor, we face the problems of selectivity, and uh, this was also the case for our molecule. And on this slide, you can see uh, at the profile, um, pharmacodynamic profile of our molecule. So we have managed to find a molecule that is potent in low nanomolar concentrations, and this potency is quite similar to uh, today in phase two AZD4547 uh, from AstraZeneca molecule. So as you can see, we are similar effective to inhibit the uh, FGFR1, 2, and 3 isoform. When we look at the selectivity, we are a little bit more selective to AstraZeneca compound. And when we look at the other molecules, FGFR inhibitors, we are similar or more selective uh, when we compare to others that are now in um, clinical uh, stage. Uh, when we test our molecule in cell lines, we see a consistent, uh, consistent inhibition of tumor cell lines that, have, that are FGFR driven, and those that, uh, that lack FGFR uh, genetic aberrations, in general, our molecule is inactive. So this profile gave us rationale to go ahead to move to the animal studies. And we have several lines um, of uh, confirmation from many animal models using both tumor cell lines, but also patient-derived xenographs. And these models are more informative uh, and um, translative into clinical effect that we can have when administering our product uh, to humans. So in all of these models uh, where um, cell lines or, or tumors were, had uh, genetic aberrations of FGFR, we can see very robust effect uh, in the dose uh, in case of mice between 10 to 40 milligram per kg administered twice weekly. So we have very good preclinical evidence to uh, sh uh, showing effect of our molecule in many tumors. And as, we, as you know, we are particularly target gastric, squamous lung, and, gas and uh, bladder cancer. Thank you, Mr. President. To be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, I thought that psychiatry is fascinating and difficult and quite complicated. But I think I should change my mind because oncology is incredible. And the next question is to Professor Harastowska. 
CPL116 is, in, is tested in the phase 11b in solid tumors. And can you please tell us more details about design of this study and expected readouts? Uh, if phase two studies design is already known? So indeed, oncology is fascinating. I very much agree. And therefore, I'm really happy to be part of the joint uh, project developed with uh, Salon Pharma. My, my institution uh, is part of the ongoing clinical trial, phase 1-1B. And uh, in this trial, we are going to uh, in, in enroll patients as per standard 3 plus 3 design. The first part of the trial, the initial dose escalation, uh, is open to a wide variety of cancers to patients not only with uh, advanced bladder, gastric and squamous lung cancer, uh, but also with cholangiocarcinoma, sarcoma and endometrial uh, cancer. Uh, because in this part we do not really identify the aberrations. So this is uh, the, the status of FGFRs uh, is not tested. We uh, started from the low dose of 12.5 milligrams and four cohorts are to be included. However, in the next part, part two and then part three, uh, we are going to pre-select patients uh, specifically as per biomarkers, as per FGFR aberrations. In part two, this is a dose escalation part two, up to four cohorts are to be involved. We intend to identify the maximum tolerated dose specifically and only in patients with squamous lung cancer, bladder cancer and gastric cancer. So as soon as uh, MTD uh, is established, two interim dose cohorts are to be open. Uh, also, uh, in order to uh, analyze the potential efficacy of, um, of our molecule. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, we have already um, achieved uh, approval from regulators and biotechs committee. Uh, four centers are uh, actively recruiting, uh, two, uh, two more to uh, be started. We already have cohort four active with 100 milligram of the uh, of the molecule, and cohort five is to be open quite soon. And importantly, uh, in those patients who have already been enrolled into the into the trial, we observed um, specific and very positive. Uh, uh, signals in terms of disease stabilization and also importantly no severe adverse effects were observed. I think this is very important for the for the future um, uh, trials hopefully. Thank you Professor Horostowska but we know the head coach is here and Mr. President I know that you have additional information about phase two. Yeah, so we are really uh, happy with what we can see in our phase 1-1b. So the study is running. Uh, we expect to have uh, more data in the next uh, months. So we are thinking about phase 2. And um, given the uh, very fast uh, approval of uh, first FGFR inhibitors in urothelial cancer and uh, choloangiocarcinoma from J&J inside, and these approvals were based on relatively small phase two, 80, 90 patient studies. So our phase two will consist of two stage uh, parts. It will be two stage design in which we will uh, recruit in the first stage around 40 patients and in pre-specific pre um, uh, in term analysis, we will, uh, we will uh, analyze the futility and, uh, and uh, response. And uh, depending on the readouts from this uh, interim analysis, we will take decision to move forward the study to recruit additional around 40 patients. So I think it is, this is a very rational design that can be uh, very cost effective, but rationally designed to uh, give up compound if not seen effect 
sufficient effect after 40 patients. But once the effect is uh, meeting the pre-specified pre uh, criteria, we'll move forward and recruit around 80 patients. So if in these three tumors, gastric, bladder or squamous lung, we can see similar response as was seen for first approval agents like 30% more, I think this is very, very attractive a molecule to be uh, to be uh, then uh, prepare application to for uh, drug application. So we are very optimistic here, and uh, the phase two uh, should start immediately after the readouts from phase one one B. Hopefully, positive that can be seen in the next in the next uh, quarters. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Horostowska. And I agree with you that oncology is very exciting and very complicated. Thank you for your presentation. And I think that for all our participants, it's a huge dose of knowledge because oncology could result, because these studies, these um, potentially drugs, and I'm optimistic about future about this, we can resolve many problems for many of our patients. But the next stage of our um, meeting to today is inflammatory diseases. So stay with us and let's move to the next part of our meeting, inflammatory diseases. With me is Mr. President Dr. Maciej Wieczorek and Professor Horostowska Wnimko. It's one of the best pulmonologists, as you know, what I have ever met in my life. And we talk about now about inflammatory diseases. We have uh, more and more knowledge about inflammatory uh, diseases and about pulmonar pulmonary manifestations, uh, particularly interstitial lung disease, in the course of many autoimmune diseases, among them rheumatoid arthritis. The management of rheumatoid arthritis and uh, interstitial lung disease is a challenge. I know because many patients who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis are the patients for psychiatry because they suffer from depression disorder too, because the pathogenesis of depression and autoimmune diseases is very similar uh, because of immunology. So, Professor, would you share with us this topic? Uh, it's epidemiolo epidemiology and current management. Professor Horostowska. Yes, indeed, uh, the connective tissue diseases are a group of uh, multitude um, uh, diseases with uh, very um, divergent clinical presentation and importantly involving uh, mostly uh, respiratory tract. Essentially, in any of those diseases, lungs could be involved. Uh, and that uh, very much affects uh, the diagnostics, the follow-up and treatment of, of the patient, but importantly also the, uh, the prognostics, the prognosis of the patients. Uh, as you can see, uh, the um, CTD prevalence is not as rare as one might think. Those diseases are actually uh, a very important uh, um, medical uh, and uh, social problem. And uh, lung involvement is also significant. The, the, the higher prevalence of lung involvement is observed in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and in sclerodermia. Uh, as I said, the clinical manifestations per se might be quite different. Nevertheless, uh, the mortality uh, of those patients is severely affected by lung involvement. Actually, uh, lung involvement is considered as a major risk factor for uh, that in those patients. And I think that very well shows how very important it is uh, the effective uh, therapeutic approach to the uh, interstitial lung disease associated with, um, uh, with uh, that group of, of diseases. And I mentioned already re rheumatoid arthritis because this is uh, a quite, quite, quite um, prevalent disease um, 
it is uh, it is um, considered that as many as one percent of population in developed countries is affected by rheumatoid arthritis and speaking of complication as many as 40 percent of those patients could actually uh, have some type of lung involvement um, as I mentioned, mortality is uh, as a significant complication, if I might say so. But please observe that in terms of mortality, actually the rate uh, in patients with lung involvement increases uh, more than twice in rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, lung involvement might have a different uh, histologic and um, clinical characteristic. Uh, most often as usual interstitial pneumonia or non-specific um, interstitial pneumonia. However, we uh, use a quite similar diagnostic approach, mostly high-resolution uh, computer tomography of the, of the chest, as well as pulmonary uh, function tests. Uh, there are no, unfortunately, specific biomarkers that could help us to predict the risk of mortality in the group of patients. And also in terms of treatment, we most often use, um, let's say, unspecific approach, either using systemic corticosteroids or immunosuppressive agents, uh, recently also biologic ag agents, However, I think from the clinical point of view, it would be really helpful to have agents that would really make our treatment approach more effective. Thank you, Professor Horostowska. Immunology system is very complicated and we are still in Salon Pharma headquarters. Ladies and gentlemen, the next question to Mr. President. We know that CPL116 is the first dual jack rock inhibitor in the clinical development. As a psychiatrist, I always wonder at how such molecules are discovered. And before we move to its clinical potential, Mr. President, can you present discovery and preclinical efforts with this program? Uh, well, actually, uh, a jack rock inhibitor was uh, rationally designed by us. And we have started almost 10 years ago uh, simply looking for JAK inhibitors. At that time, uh, inhibiting JAK kinases were very, very attractive uh, targets in um, oncological diseases. We know today there are a few of them approved in uh, many uh, blood tumors. So uh, we did the same, but in the same time, we realized that Patients with uh, autoimmune diseases are not dying because of underlying disease, but they are dying because of increased CV risk or because of other manifestations like interstitial lung disease. So we wonder how to modify our molecule to have additional property of having CV risk protection and probably to be effective in fibrosis. And this is the rationale behind looking for both JAK inhibition as anti-inflammatory property compound and antifibrotic and CV protection effect that was uh, pursued by us by showing this dual JAK rock inhibition. And we managed that. We found one of the molecules from our very large library to have this dual action and it's called CPL116. As you can see on this slide, this is very potent inhibitor with the JAK inhibition on similar potency to tofacitinib, currently the most widely used JAK inhibitor on the market. But we are more prefer preferential for JAK1 and JAK3 over JAK2 kinases. So that's good. Uh, because with that, we think we can have such better uh, hematological profile. But in the same time, we are very potent uh, on rock kinases, on both rock one, rock two. And here on this slide, you can see the comparison to Fasudil, the only approved rock inhibitor. So we have very effective, potent and quite selective agents 
and on the left you have the selectivity parameters. With all of this data, uh, we wanted to confirm the anti-inflammatory property, and on this slide you can see that our inhibitor is very potent inhibitor of uh, the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. You can see uh, you can see inhibition of uh, interleukin six TNF alpha to major cytokines responsible for inflammation in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But in general, we have the uh, we have the uh, blocking of more, almost all of pro-inflammatory cytokines using our inhibitor. But also we can see. Uh, effect uh, in both in vitro and then animal studies, effect suggesting that we are a very strong, very potent inhibitor of rock kinases. And here on this slide, we can see that we are blocking downstream proteins in rock signaling. This is phosphorylation of MLC and MYPT1. And this data also confirm in very elegant myography experiments so again, we can see the uh, vasorelactant effect and anti-contractor effect suggesting rock inhibition with our agent. So with all of this preclinical data, we went to animals and we have very robust efficacy data in almost all animal models where we are using anti-inflammatory jack inhibition with RA, psoriasis, um, lupus, Crohn disease, but we have unexpectedly, we can see effect in those models, animal models, that require both anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic effect. And this is pulmonary arterial hypertension, where we compare our molecule to sildenafil, today one of the most commonly used agents in pulmonary arterial hypertension, but also in uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we use nintedanib as our active control. And again, we have much more consistent effect of our molecule in comparison to nintedanib. Again, today, the standard of care in uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So these data really are very optimistic. And I think we have very, uh, very strong evidence to have those anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic activity with our agents. On this slide, you can see comparison in RA study in collagen-induced RA model with tofacitinib, uh, JAK inhibitor, and with the, with, at the similar nominal doses, we have more pronounced effect uh, with our agent in comparison to tofacitinib. So we were a little bit afraid of toxicity given this dual mechanism of action. So we are really surprised, positively surprised, that we are not very toxic in GMP toxicologic pro program. So when we compare our agents to approve JAK inhibitors, we can see, based on no observed adverse event level, an order of magnitude higher uh, levels uh, for our compound in both rodent and non-rodent studies in comparison to balicitinib, tofacitinib and upadacitinib, JAK inhibitors that are approved. So this is really good data. And when we sum up the JAK rock inhibitor, I think we can expect cardioprotective uh, potential with this rock inhibition. There are more and more data suggesting that statins and many inhibitors that are inhibiting ROCs, some of the cardioprotection potential comes from ROC inhibition. We have FASODIL approved in some of kind of stroke. And we can uh, have additional anti-inflammatory active through, uh, ac actions through ROC inhibition. This is mostly in interleukin-17 axis. So with all of that, we, we can exploit the new avenues of, tr of testing this agent in such settings like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or intestinal lung disease associated with many autoimmune diseases and particularly rheumatoid arthritis. And indeed, um, pulmonary arterial hypertension that you have mentioned uh, is uh, 
a strong uh, risk factor for mortality in those patients, in patients with uh, connective tissue disease, interstitial lung uh, disease. And therefore, this is a complication that we fear very much as a clinician. Uh, I do believe that this signal, it's still a signal, as the data come from the preclinical pre pre phase. However, it, I, I, as a clinician, consider as a very optimistic. Very important information, I think, so for us. But the next question to Professor Horostowska is, I've, I've been told uh, that CPL-116 was granted expedite uh, regulatory path due to COVID-19 uh, potential. What was rationale behind that? Well, um, indeed, COVID-19 is a hot is a burning topic at the moment and definitely uh, uh, the, the highest, highest unmet need uh, we could actually discuss today. And as you know, uh, in, um, on average 20% of patients, uh, the COVID-19 is complicated by the bilateral pneumonia and those patients are most often admitted to the hospital, they need the hospital care. And many of them, uh, in many of them, the massive immune response uh, develops, uh, so-called cytokine storm. Those patients, uh, unfortunately, develop the uh, lung tissue damage, uh, the uh, respiratory failure, and need uh, support in terms of either oxygen therapy or mechanical uh, invasive, non-invasive ventilation. So up to date, uh, we have essentially three clinical trials uh, proving the effectiveness of either uh, antiviral therapy, and this is remdesivir, as you know, or anti-inflammatory -inflamm treatment with uh, dexamethasone. But those two clinical trials proved that we, with those treatments, we actually target two different groups of uh, uh, COVID-19 patients with acute clinical presentation. As per the um, uh, ordinal scale of COVID-19 severity, remdesivir is most potent in uh, group four. Those are patients that uh, do not as yet need um, uh, supplemental oxygen treatment. And uh, whereas the dexamethasone, so anti-inflammatory treatment, is most, uh, most effective in uh, group seven. So those patients who are, um, are um, admitted to and treated due to very severe presentation and uh, are treated with uh, me mechanical ventilation. So that leaves us with the so-called grade zone of group uh, five and six, as shown uh, on this uh, figure. And uh, very recently, uh, New England Journal of Medicine published the um, results from the clinical trial with um, uh, YAK1, YAK2 yak inhibitor. Very promising results that uh, show that uh, the combined treatment uh, of barcitinib and remdesivir uh, versus placebo plus, uh, plus remdesivir um, proved very effective in patients uh, needing oxygen uh, supplementation or non-invasive um, mechanical ventilation in terms of time uh, to recovery, in particular group six, so those are patients uh, treated with NIHH. Uh, in those patients, time to recovery uh, was uh, on average 10 days, whereas in a uh, group treated with remdesivir only 18 days. I think that shows uh, quite a spectacular result. And therefore, uh, uh, therefore we could really um, uh, pose a question whether uh, treatment with uh, dual YACROC, uh, anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic inhibitor might be hypothetically, the treatment of for, uh, for COVID-19 uh, severe patients. Wow. So I have no anxiety now because uh, Jack Rock inhibitors uh, can improve the natural history of COVID-19, probably. Might, might improve. This is the, I would say, um, hypothesis. hypothesis. Uh, but I think very fascinating and quite exciting hypothesis that I would like really to um, research. But future sounds optimistic, I think so. 
Well, yes, I think the more we know, the higher a probability we will find a solution for the burning question and the highly unmet need uh, COVID-19. But when we talk about future, Mr. President, you have started phase one clinical development. Where are you with this study and what is planned next? Yeah, so uh, we are in very good momentum today because we are just finishing phase one. Uh, it's, uh, the study has started last year um, in the fourth quarter and we have already um, completed single ascending doses, uh, food, con food cohort uh, interaction study and uh, today we are just, uh, we will administer soon patients with, uh, with uh, uh, multiply ascending doses to see what is the PK safety and different doses of this compound. Up to now, the safety results are very good. We don't see any, any toxicity uh, from the administration of the compound. The initial PK profile is also very, very good. So uh, we look forward for phase two program. And uh, as there are plenty of uh, clinical settings in uh, autoimmune diseases, we want to initiate few proof of concept studies targeting both RA psoriasis, but also RA interstitial lung disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we want to be smart in design of the studies. Mostly the studies will be driven by biomarkers uh, as quickly as possible to have readouts. And COVID is today is, uh, is, uh, is a great setting. We know there are hundreds of thousands of patients in the hospital. So potentially we, can, we could, uh, we could uh, starting from September, start phase two, phase through study uh, with our agent in probably uh, the, um, the patients in stage five and six, as Professor Hostoska mentioned, with more predictable benefit in this patient population. So if we think about composite endpoints, with the, uh, with the progression, mortality, and probably lung, um, lung uh, uh, impairment uh, of the disease, we could have uh, with five, 600 patients study, statistical power to see uh, clinical benefits uh, with our agents. So very, uh, very attractive times, very attractive momentum for this, uh, for this compound. And we are very optimistic for the future. Thank you, Mr. President. So, as you see, the future sounds optimistic because Celon Pharma is focused for many molecules and we need immediately next phases, Mr. President. I think so. And so, I would like to thank you all the experts in this excellent key opinion leader session. Thank you, Professor Horostowska, uh, once again for being here in Celon Pharma headquarters. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Professor Edward Vieta from Barcelona, and thank you, Professor Soares from Houston. I think that, uh, I hope that you learned a lot of hot therapeutic areas in huge unmet needs in these therapeutic areas. Now, let's go back to Małgosia. Thank you for this interesting session. As you have noticed, as a company, we prefer to focus on drug development, not creating television production. So please forgive us of minor uh, imperfections that have occurred during the recording. While well, connecting two continents at the same time can be challenging. But now uh, we move to the Q&A session. Uh, to participate on it, please click uh, Teams link con uh, available at on our website. Um, just right now, uh, we kindly ask you to provide your full name and surname when joining the session. We want to meet you um, uh, as well. And please ask the questions in. English. Uh, in this uh, session, uh, the, the participation of uh, participants of this session will be a company representatives as well as expert from the KIOLS session, Professor Horostowska Winimka, and we have together with us Professor Suarez straight from the uh, Texas. So please join the link Teams link available on the on the website just right now. Take your time uh, and we'll back to you in a moment.
So let's start our Q&A session. Uh, thank you for our questions that we have already received. It seems that we raised uh, both of interesting points all in all presentations. So let's try to take a look, uh, closer uh, look on them. Mm, feel free to ask your question via chat, uh, available on our website via Teams chat. But if you prefer to speak in person uh, to our guest, uh, there is also such a possibility for you. Uh, just uh, use raise hand button in Teams to do it. And we'll give you the floor. Uh, so I would like to address the first question to uh, Professor Hosrowska. Mm. Do you agree with the statement that the medicine in post-COVID area, especially in area of lung diseases, will take on a new dimension and what um, medical challenges in this area we will be facing soon and uh, this is a uh, um, request for your opinion on this topic. Well definitely as, as we mentioned COVID-19 is a highly unmet or uh, as it was said a burning need at the moment mostly due to the uh, acute COVID-19 presentation. Uh, this is, the, this is the, the wave or the problem we are currently facing uh, in our hospitals, uh, but also in the outpatient clinics. And uh, I think the, the potential uh, and uh, the need for new therapies has been uh, very well presented. Nevertheless, as you correctly posed the question, there is so much more about the current situation than only acute phase of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I really do see, see it in my everyday practice, clinical practice. Uh, uh, by that, I mean the post-COVID patients, uh, both the, the, the so-called long COVID patients, so patients that have actually uh, gone through the acute phase and, uh, and still do present with, um, uh, with the respiratory symptoms. But also, and even those patients who might have not been actually very severely uh, ill due to the COVID-19, however, start to develop or to present symptoms. So all those groups of patients uh, would definitely need a specialized respiratory care. And I do believe that for those patients, we probably would also need to develop a very specific and uh, very, um, uh, very well tailored um, follow up programs that would include uh, the clinical follow up follow up but also the uh, the new and dedicated treatment approach and here I would like just to mention the the, the new option for jack rock uh, inhibition still this is a working hypothesis this is a certain potential I do see uh, we discussed the acute phase but if you think about the patients with uh, long COVID or continuous respiratory presentation of COVID-19, I could really think about the um, potential clinical application, hypothetic again, for the anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic uh, activity uh, or treatment. And uh, so in that aspect, I think the, uh, definitely there is much to be done in, in this field. Thank you for thank you very much. Um, coming back for a, a little while to bipolar disorders, um, and I have a question addressed to Professor Suarez. When talking about the unmet need for bipolar depression, what features of any new potential treatments for this condition would you consider to be mostly desired by clinicians? Well, that scenario. Uh of real need, there are few medications available uh, currently, and the efficacy for you know for them isn't that great. Uh, they also uh, take a while to work, and I have a higher risk of actually uh, making the patient switch into a manic phase. So, a new medication for bipolar depression that would work reasonably fast, that would be well. Uh, tolerated and carry lower potential to switch for mania or hypomania would be really well received because that's an area of real need for our patients. 
Thank you, Professor Suarez. Um, and actually, we have a first question for uh, from our audience. Uh, Ms. Katarzyna Kosiorek, uh, the floor is yours. Please on you, unmute your mic to, so we can't hear you properly. Take your time. We're waiting for your questions, but you're still on mute. Uh, okay, it seems like we're facing here some technical issues from uh, uh, exter external ones. Uh, so uh, we have another external question. Uh, um, please, we need Aguilar from City. Uh, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your questions. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, we can hear you good. Okay, great. Uh, this is Vinit Agrawal from City. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. It was really great. Uh, so I have three questions. So first is, uh, so NICE rejected Pravato last year. Just wanted to know your thoughts there and implications, uh, you know, for your product, uh, you know, going forward. Then the second one was um, on the JAGs, right? So post the oral surveillance trial for Jeljans, uh, there have been few Padupa delays by the FDA for other JAGs, right? Do you do you see this safety issue being a whole class issue and with competition emerging from tick to how do you see the landscape emerging, right? And then uh, finally, which companies in your view could be the natural partners for the neuroscience portfolio? Thank you. Thank you very much. These are excellent questions. And uh, maybe let's start, let's start with this uh, first question about Spravato. Uh, uh, refusal of uh, in NICE. So, you know, in this health economics decisions, you always look at the uh, magnitude of effects and the cost of the treatment. Mm -hmm. So with Pravato in unipolar depression, uh, the magnitude of effect was not as large in phase three. And at the same time, uh, Pravato costs around monthly therapy, costs around three to five thousand dollars. So. I think this was uh, taken into account by British, uh, British, uh, you know, uh, healthcare um, uh, payers' once assessment of the application. So it's difficult to say whether the same can be uh, can be used when evaluation when evaluating our application. We are targeting different diseases treatment-resistant bipolar depression with much less therapeutic option. And of course, let's see what will be the magnitude of benefit of our therapy in different indications. So I would not, uh, you know, be very afraid and scared with the what's happened uh, with Pravato in British uh, assessment. We know British regulators, assessors are very tough and they use that strategy for uh, negotiating better prices for the future. Uh, moving to your second question, this is about tofacitinib safety um, and whether this is the class effect or not, we don't know. Uh, when we have data from other um, agents, I think data sets from uh, upadacitinib uh, are not suggesting any massive risk, cardiovascular risk for this agent. But when we look from the uh, perspective uh, into the whole class, we can see that they are associated with some, uh, you know, uh, worsening of lipid profile. All of them are associated with increases in uh, total cholesterol and LDL. In the same time, some increases in HDL is seen. So I think this is the uh, common for all of these agents, so they impair lipid profile. But in the same time, we can see different, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact of these agents, different JAK inhibitors uh, on platelets. 
some of them increases platelets, some of them decreases platelets into different hematological properties. So the answer is we don't know. We know about tofacitinib that is, it's associated with some increase in CV risk. Uh, whether this will be effect class, we don't know. My personal feeling is that we cannot see as much for other agents as we can see for tofacitinib. But again, we should not be compared to JAK inhibitors because we have ROC inhibition, vasorelaxant, anti-contractile. We know it's good for our body to have ROC inhibition. And statins do that. And statins do that, particularly newer statins, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, and lesser simvastatin. So those statins that we know are associated with decreased CV risk in large, uh, large um, studies. So I think we are optimistic that this is not class effect and we think our agent have, have, has clear differentiation here. And your third question was I can handle that. That's what you can handle, please. So, uh, so um, we are testing the waters here in a way that Falkieri is our first uh, program, which is uh, uh, now being moved to the phase three clinicals. Uh, in a way, it's ready for partnering. Uh, we are therefore evaluating different strategic options. So one of them is to look for the global partner that is strong in, in CNS. Uh, so you know all these uh, big, uh, uh, big names here. Uh, or alternatively to look for a partner on a regional basis, uh, to divide the rights into US, Europe, uh, 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 let's say China and uh, Southeast Asia, rest of the world, and to try to partner with different partners uh, uh, in these territories. Uh, these partners could, of course, include also the global names that uh, uh, we would uh, look uh, to uh, discuss the first option. Uh, the third one, though, that we are also evaluating is to move to the phase three clinicals without the partner and then uh, subsequently reevaluate the options uh, uh, when we will be more advanced with phase three clinicals. Uh, uh, so uh, we are, e in a way, evaluating all such options right now and uh, uh, probably it needs uh, at least uh, a few more weeks, if not months, for us to finally decide which way we would go. Okay, perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Ranit. Do you have any follow-up questions to this part? Okay. If not, uh, we're moving back to Texas again. <laughs> Professor Suarez, um, another question uh, to you. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on the use of ketamine in mood disorders in the past and provide some comments on various forms of esketamine administration that are available right now? Right. So ketamine has proven to be uh, a imp very important advance uh, in treating uh, you know, depression and patients with mood disorders. Uh, I would say it's probably the biggest advance in treating mood, disorder, mood disorders patients uh, for the past uh, decade or so. And the reason is that uh, it seems to work really fast. And uh, I mean, where you see differentiation, I mean, often like after a week. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it also uh, efficacy is, is good. Uh, obviously, it started with the intravenous administrations. Uh, that's uh, a generic drug where, you know, there was not much there for any company to try to pursue that uh, as, you know, a potentially approved FDA product. However, uh, there is a lot of off-label use of uh, uh, injected ketamine for treatment-resistant patients with depression. And so, so it's, it's used in an off-label basis quite a bit, actually. It changed a little bit with the uh, advent of esketamine, which, uh, you know, what is available in the U.S. is really uh, the inhaled, uh, uh, is provided for, and it's easier to administer. The, uh, the effects seem to be uh, reasonably fast. 
So that has been an important uh, improvement in the toolbox we have to treat patients with uh, unipolar depression. That's what the approval is. And uh, obviously, uh, these things need to be tested specifically for bipolar depression. Bipolar depression is an even bigger uh, uh, unmet need because you know those are generally difficult to treat patients and the available medications aren't really as efficacious. So uh, the, there is a need for uh, a products tested specifically for uh, bipolar depression, primarily if they will work fast, tolerability uh, is good and efficacy is good as well you know, for treatment resistant patients. So I'm very enthusiastic about the possibility you know, to see new data that phase three uh, uh, trials, I mean, that would address that uh, unmet need with new products that would uh, uh, have the potential for fast effects and, and good uh, uh, tolerability and also easy to administer, you know, better than the injections of ketamine. There have been small studies trying to administer ketamine in other ways like subcutaneous administration, oral administration, with some interesting results uh, early on with uh, just, you know, regular uh, ketamine. But, but again, those, uh, since it is, uh, of, of patent, there is just not enough uh, interest there from. Uh, I'm going to you to use the raise a hand button in Teams to ask your questions in person to our guests. Uh, and I can see and hear that we have um, Mrs. Kasia Kosiorek with us. Uh, please ask your questions to the participants. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you properly. The floor is yours. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, I have uh, several questions. First, uh, I would like to congratulate on the FALC Phase 2 results in treatment of resistant bipolar depression. And in terms of observed therapeutic size, uh, as you mentioned, how is this compared to the effect size of other agents that are used in the indication of the BPD? such as atypical uh, antipsychotics or mood stabilizers uh, drugs. And the next part of the question, the readouts from the Valkyrie phase two have indicated a high significance, uh, clinical significance in the treatment of BPD. And how this result can help you in terms of discussion with regulators? Do you see the potential for the expedited designations as a breakthrough therapy designation, for example? Thank you. So maybe the first question, Professor Soares, would you would you like to address the first question about effect size? Do you have your uh, your thoughts about that? Yeah, sure. The, you know the data that I've seen from phase two uh, uh, trials. I mean, look, looks very robust. The effect size is uh, uh, impressive. You know, compared to uh the other few uh, available treatments in this area of bipolar depression so it, it looks very promising obviously needs to be uh you know replicated and expanded in a phase three study but it looks very promising yeah so i, I we have a particular focus on that and i remember when we look at the data and extracted effect sizes for antipsychotics uh, we can see effect size of between 03 to 0607 maximum. So this is like small to medium effect size. So our effect size is, you know, we are doubling effect size in our study. So this is, I have not seen the effect size of our magnitude in any previous studies. Uh, as relates to your second question uh, in uh, expedite, uh, expedite uh, path, well, as I said, we are working together with Parexcel, and this is our CRO that, that uh, is supporting us in preparation for EMA and FDA. And I can just say today, yes, we are very, uh, we are evaluating the possibility for breakthrough designation for bipolar depression. And uh, we have not yet filed such application, but I can say that this is very likely, that we have sufficient data to ask for that. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so if I have a chance, to, I would like to ask another question. Um, yes, so this question is related to the FGFR inhibitor. In terms of uh, this project, uh, recently the company Five Prime Therapeutics has uh, shown to, to, to this the they project to be quite effective in the gastric cancer therapeutic area. Does those results change anything in terms of your selected therapeutics areas, uh, gastric cancer in particular? Thank you. <laughs> Professor, would like to comment on gastric cancer? What's your thinking today? Well, I am I am a respiratory specialist, so mm -hmm. I, I don't really feel expert in the field of gastric cancer. Nevertheless, uh, well, with personalized medicine, I think the major issue is, uh, as we discussed, not only to have the active and potent molecule, but also to identify the um, the right uh, cohort or the right group of, of, of patients. Therefore, with FGFR inhibitors, uh, if you look at this uh, group of molecules per se, the major problem have been um, actually first the activity of the uh, of the of the molecules, the inhibitory activity of the molecules, so the the, the treatment or uh, pharmacological potential that is interesting from uh, from the point of view of of drug de development. But uh, the second problem, and actually, in my opinion, this is equally important as shown by number of clinical trials, is the really specific and uh, up to the point and identification of patients. I, I mentioned in my presentation that the, the clinical trial was designed uh, alongside with the uh, uh, discovery uh, or proof of concept of uh, dedicated uh, companion diagnostic. And I think this is as important as uh, really um, providing the optimal characteristic of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of, of the drug. And that actually, in my opinion, was a major obstacle and major problem in uh, published clinical trials. Um, but the, the, the very specific identification of, let's say, responders, the resp patient who potentially would respond to the treatment. Yeah, but I would like to add that this specific study that was published uh, with uh, monoclonal antibody targeting FGFR from 5' prime, for us it was uh, really something new because they have found that the overexpression of FGFR2 is not in 10% of patients that we thought and our results from our own studies from Poland suggested the same, but it's closer to 30, even more percent of patients. So one reason is that they uh, run this study in also Asian countries, and probably we have much more prevalence of this FGFR overexpression in Asia. But, for, but it, it's, that's good. I mean, it means that if we think about gastric cancer, it, and we have the uh, much uh, much uh, overexpression is not in 10 but 30 percent of the global patients. For sure, it's more attractive for this product, and and we look forward testing our agent in gastric cancer, and maybe it's move a little bit, you know, uh, in front of uh, you know attractiveness of uh, of this uh, this, this treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any follow-up questions you. to this part? Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, the last please. question is related to the jack rock inhibitor. And with regard to this project, it is known that anti-inflammatory therapy with similar agents such as tofacitinib mm -hmm. carries some cardiovascular mm -hmm. risk, as you mentioned. Uh, the therapy with rock inhibitor significantly reduced the number of cardiovascular events. So could you tell something more about the clinical benefits of the dual mechanism of action of, of your project, uh, especially in the context of cardiovascular benefits and, uh, for example, um, other tissues protection, such as lung and renal protection? Thank you. 
I think this is this is very a uh, large topic, and uh, we c we we don't have time to to discuss all of that. But of course, it's too early to say that we have clinical evidence of this CV protection. We are we think there are very good chances to see that clinically, based on preclinical experiments, based on mechanism of action, and based of target inhibition we can see from phase one. So with our PK. PD simulation, we have good, good data to think that we could target both jugs and rocks with our agent in the therapeutic doses. Uh, but of course, we need to design our phase two and phase three program first using biomarkers in phase two and then clinical endpoints in phase three to prove that. So it's too early to say that we will deliver that, but we are, we are well positioned and the agent is ideal to see the effect. It goes beyond simple jack inhibition, and I think this is the first very attractive agent that we should test this CV protection, CV risk protection with that in the autoimmune diseases that are, as I said, we have our real CV risk uh, in these settings, in these diseases. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and for, for, for the answer. Uh, this is, ladies and gentlemen, the last chance to use the uh, raise hand button. Um, but uh, now we will move into the questions that we have already received via email during the session. And I would like this one to address to uh, Jacek Glinka because as far as I know, will be very happy to, to answer it. Well, Salmex continues to be grown engine of your generic business. Given your ambitious plans to further grow your expo sales, will you have to expand your manufacturing capacity in case you get approvals to launch this product in China or in the US? Uh, that's a tough question. I would say uh, uh, maybe. Right now, uh, our current capacities are at the level of uh, 8 million inhalers per year. We are increasing that this year to 11 million inhalers. Uh, I think that uh, last year our total production was at the level of 1.3, 1.4 million inhalers, which means that we could uh, talk about like an order of magnitude uh, bigger capacities than we have current demand. Uh, Obviously, China and US are big markets, and therefore, once we enter these markets, the, the capacity might not be sufficient. Uh, we are planning to enter the Chinese market uh, more or less uh, two, three years from now. We are finishing the, the, the studies, and subsequently, we would file for the registration. So probably we could talk about this time frame when we would uh, launch uh, in, uh, in China and subsequently probably slightly later in the US. Uh, we would have enough sufficient time to, to see if there is a need to further increase the capacities. Uh, uh, we have uh, done that uh, last year, uh, quadrupling the, the level of capacities, uh, so we can do it again if the need will be, but for the time being, we are, I would say, fully secured with the capacities for uh, all the markets, uh, uh, maybe even including China and the US. Thank you. Uh, and another one, this one needs to be probably addressed to Professor Horostowska. Uh, what percentage of diagnosed patients are currently being tested to determine the FGFR mutations? And how do you expect it to ramp up the following launch of this two new agents for bladder cancer and other cancers. Thank you very much. Well, the, actually the answer depends very much of the uh, local or the national uh, policy and uh, the regulators. Uh, and as an example, I could uh, refer to two um, opposite, let's say, um, um, clinical scenarios. Uh, one would be uh, United States. If one looks at the current guidelines, then definitely white uh, genomic profiling is the preferred option. For example, in lung cancer, this is actually the, uh, the recommended uh, triodiagnostic strategy to profile your patient very early, 
prior to the first line, prior to any therapeutic decision. We know uh, very well, uh, it has been proven by a number of, of uh, clinical trials as well as um, uh, clinical practice that the uh, patients with a driver mutation should optimally be treated with a personalized approach right away, uh, by which I mean uh, starting from the first line. So therefore, with wide genomic profiling, FGFR, um, uh, FGFR, FGFR aberrations would be uh, actually identified. And the opposite scenario is uh, Poland. I think this is also a very good example of the um, clinical practice that is very much um, tailored by the uh, local reimbursement policy or the um, uh, availability of, of uh, specific treatments. So FGFR inhibitors are not reimbursed uh, in Poland uh, by health insurance, uh, public health insurance. Therefore, it's not a routine part of, of diagnostics. It's not routine part of testing. Uh, however, we do we do it, uh, we mm, look at those aberrations as well, uh, providing the patient is uh, profiled mm, broadly uh, with new, sequ uh, new gener generation sequencing, and then those patients might receive treatment only within the clinical trial setting. Therefore, you could see the different uh, diagnostic strategies that heavily depend on the actually treatment options, treatment possibilities. And that uh, uh, also would uh, very much reflect on the, on the numbers you ask about numbers. So uh, I, I cannot really say in Poland that would probably be a very, very uh, small number of patients. However, I expect that in the United States, it really very much depends on when uh, and where the patient is being diagnosed in uh, in the bigger, in the leading oncology uh, centers, definitely the majority of patients are uh, uh, widely uh, profiled and therefore uh, are also potential candidates for uh, for that group of uh, of um, of drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, we have another question um, which was addressed on our chat uh, uh, some time ago uh, from Robin Jan. Uh, Does it make sense for a company of that size to concentrate on such different areas instead of stick with one or two? So the, the, this is a very good question and I think this question I tried to, uh, to address in the first part of the presentation. So it's not typical for such size of company in the US to have such broad pipeline of innovative drugs. But we must remember that we are unique in the sense that we have organically grew in the last two decades and we could, we implemented uh, strategies to have broad pipeline. And we have also very unique financing model. And with it, within this model, we have many sources of financing. So we went broad in our product development. And I think it has lots of advantages because we are securing risk of failures that are inevitably uh, you know, linked to this type of business. Uh, so I think we have the best strategy today in the country where we are and with the story we have. So this is the response. I think this is the optimal strategy for us. We go broad, but we are securing in both financial and, and attrition. I could add to that, that uh, uh, if you allow, Maciej, that uh, you see, we have 20 years experience in, in development, initially generics, then innovative products. Uh, with that, we have built the organization, which is today 
500 people, of which almost 200 are scientists, which have gained relevant experience over the course of years in these therapeutical categories that we focus on. So, so yes, there is four, not one, but within these four areas, we believe we build sufficient content, robustness and expertise that is supporting us, uh, uh, and we could say that we can build an effective way to manage these programs uh, and move them as we do without many substantial failures from, from preclinical to phase one, phase two, and subsequently phase three, and commercialization. We believe we can do that. We have strong and robust organization with a lot of, a lot of expertise. Moreover, we are leveraging our network uh, of outside uh, third-party experts, uh, being uh, CROs, CMOs, CDMOs, and whatsoever, so, so we, we, we have built that expertise over the 25 years of working on this market. And I think that uh, that, uh, uh, that is also part of our unique uh, DNA and our unique uh, position in the biotech uh, sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I, can s I cannot see any new questions. So uh, that's maybe the time to, came to come to some some conclusions but uh, before that i uh, thank you thank you very much for uh, your participation in your part thank you our guests for all the answers if any other will occur in the nearest future feel free to ask them via email uh, directed to uh, investor relations department the presentation after today's meeting together with webcast will be today available also in uh, uh, our website so um, please uh, you, you can go back to it whenever whenever you want and now i would like to invite uh, machi vitorek to sum up today's meeting thank you Thank you very much, Monty. Again, thank you very much for participating in this first Capital Markets Day of Salon Pharma. And uh, I, th I hope you, you got an uh, update of uh, our current operations, but our ambitious uh, pipeline of new products. We are a very ambitious company, hungry for success, and we hope in the next quarters, we will deliver what we said today. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you in the next meetings.